Good afternoon to all those present. We are opening the fourth hearing of the 182 ordinary period of sessions. The goal of this hearing is to deal with the responsibility of economic actors in the processes of memory, truth, and justice. Uh, a group of civil society organizations have requested this hearing as rapporteur of memory, truth, and justice. I would like to thank you for requesting this hearing. This is a very important issue that is not that visible, but for some countries, because of some specific cases, it's not a matter that has been discussed as it should be, um, especially with regard to the responsibility of economic actors in the processes of human rights violations in armed conflicts and dictatorships in the continent. I would like to thank all of you for bringing this topic to the table. In today's hearing, my name is Antonio Rejola. I'm the president of the commission and the rapporteur for memory, truth, and justice. Today with me are Commissioner Julissa Mantilla, first vice president of the Inter-American Commission, and Commissioner Joel Hernandez. Later today, we will be joined by Commissioner Esmeralda Arosemena de Troitinho. We also have the staff members of the executive secretariat. We have uh, Shana Santos, that is a specialist of the rapporteurship of truth, memory, and justice. And we also have other members of the staff of the executive secretariat. Also, the rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, environmental rights is joining the hearing. And we have also the technical team, the communications team, and the interpreters that support us and help us to have this hearing into English. Taking into consideration this is a regional hearing and we don't have representatives on the side of the state, I would like to give the floor to the organizations for half an hour so that you can present all those comments and remarks that you consider relevant. You will see that on the screen you will have a clock that will be um, monitoring time. When you are running out of time, the clock will turn red, so please uh beware the use of time after that the commission will have some time to ask questions and react to your presentations and after that you will have another 30 minutes i think that we will have enough time to cover all the issues also the assistant executive secretary of monitoring maria claudia pulido is joining us without further ado i would like to give the floor to the civil society organizations for 30 minutes and once again, welcome to this hearing. And this hearing has been streamed live uh, through the different platforms of the commission. You have the floor. Thank you, good afternoon. First of, first of all, I would like to greet the Honorable Commission of Human Rights and Executive Secretariat. And I would like to greet all those who are joining us in this hearing on responsibility of economic actors in the processes of memory, truth, and justice. I belong to the Corporate Accountability Lab, that is an organization that tries to help economic actors accountable for their involvement in the dictatorships and our conflicts in the continent. Uh, I would like to thank for, to the commission for giving us the possibility of having this space. We have different organizations such as the CELS and this, the Corporate Accountability Lab, the Justicia Organization, Due Process of Law Foundation, the University of Virginia International Human Rights Clinic, and the Advancing Human Rights Accountability Initiative of the Latin American Center of the Oxford University. Um, this matter was already covered in its report and companies and human rights in the American standards issued by the Special Rapporteurship for Economic, Social, Cultural, and Environmental Rights, um, known as REDESCA. In that report, uh, the gap that in impunity that exists regarding this matter was made visible. And we know that this issue is not visible across the continent. Uh, in spite of the legal challenges, we would like to say that there are several barriers to hold economic actors 
responsible for their involvement in those transitional justice processes. I think we believe that this implies also a lack of compliance of the duties of the states, taking into consideration the collective interests of the petitioners and taking into consideration the concerns of civil society. We believe that it's high time to address this issue. In view of the progress made in the region, this is high time to address this matter and to overcome a culture of generalized impunity. Taking into consideration the research and the evidence that we have as petitioners, it's necessary to highlight that victim civil society organizations have initiatives that should be made a reality in order to hold economic actors responsible. For example, we have workshops and civil litigation in the context of Colombia. We have 20 lawyers who are participating in the work in this matter. And we have witnessed, for example, that the statute, uh, the prescription of the statute of limitations sometimes leads to serious violations of human rights. And sometimes there are no accountability strategies. Um, we have also a lab on corporate accountability together with other organizations, and we have participants from other countries around the world. And we have identified concern uh, or patterns of concern regarding impunity in the region. We see that transitional justice is enforced partially, and we identify the role and the responsibility of states in this matter. We would like to present the landscape we would like to show you how transitional justice or organizations have tried to address this matter and the initiatives that exist in order to guarantee memory, truth, and justice for the victims. We also will make some specific recommendations to the commission in order to conduct strategic monitoring in order to consolidate the standards in terms of corporate responsibility in the processes of memory, truth, and justice, to clarify the obligations of the state that are relevant to this matter, and to support the victims and civil society organizations. Thank you, and I would like to give the floor to one of my colleagues. Thank you, Tatiana. I will present in English if you're if that's not a concern. The Advancing Human Rights Accountability Initiative at the University of Oxford, uh, the Latin American Center. And I'm going to focus today's presentation on transitional justice and economic actors' involvement in human rights violations during past authoritarian rule and armed conflict. What I'll show is that Latin America is ahead of other world regions in truth and justice initiatives. Nonetheless, a huge impunity gap remains in the region and in the world. And we contend that the commission can support and strengthen these existing initiatives to make the region a model for addressing victims' rights and closing that impunity gap. So with regard to truth, the region's truth commissions lead the world in recognizing economic actors' involvement in past human rights atrocities. There are more Truth Commission reports in more countries in Latin America that have identified economic actors' involvement in past abuses. There are more economic actors listed by name in those reports than in any other world region, with Brazil and Guatemala taking the lead. And the economic actors mentioned represent a full range of sectors, agriculture, manufacturing, extractive, and finance. They include every type of economic actor from, individual act, from individuals to small, medium, large, domestic, state, and transnational firms and business associations. And the violations associated with these economic actors are also extensive from financing repression and armed groups, including death squads, to direct involvement in crimes against humanity, disappearance, torture, extrajudicial killing, kidnapping, slave labor, sexual and gender right, uh, violations. The victims of these abuses mainly include political opposition groups, workers, and local communities. And in addition to these official truth commission, there are also truth initiatives that, that fall outside the state ones um, that we can discuss in Q&A. 
Despite the region's leadership, uh, the truths revealed about economic actors' involvement in past violations is still extremely limited. None of the truth commissions had an official mandate to investigate economic actors' violations. The information in the reports tends to be pretty superficial, and few recommendations call for further investigation into economic actors' involvement in past uh, violations. Um, the few that do, the two that do in Brazil and Ecuador have moved slowly, uh, or if at all. Finally, the findings, as the president of the commission stated, the findings have received very little visibility in the region and in the world. In justice, Latin America has also gone farther than any other world region uh, for, in, for judicial accountability for economic actors' involvement in past human rights violations. Nearly all legal processes against economic actors' violations in the world have occurred in Latin American civil and criminal courts, not in domestic courts in other parts of the world, not in the global north, not in international or regional courts. This has also meant that convictions are also concentrated in Latin America, not elsewhere. And while few cases have reached a final verdict, nearly all the pending cases in the world are in Latin American courts. So, but despite these major accomplishments in the region, only two countries are really driving these outcomes, Argentina and Colombia. And the small number of verdicts that do exist show that widespread impunity prevails. Regarding reparations, we note certain innovative strategies in the region, such as Colombia's land restitution program and Brazil's collective reparations as a result of the settlement with Volkswagen. But a very great deal of untapped potential exists to address victims' rights to reparations. To conclude, the region is a protagonist in truth and justice for victims of economic actors past human rights abuses. That role depended on a high level of mobilization by victims, their relatives and communities, and the work of innovators, many in this uh, room or in this Zoom call, uh, who have translated these demands into human rights actions. But the limitations have been great, owing to powerful veto players uh, in the business community and their uh, allies, inopportune political contexts, and the near absence of international or regional pressure and support. Thus, despite major accomplishments, the impunity gap is enormous. The commission, we believe, could play a critical role in closing that gap and strengthening the advances to address the rights of victims to truth, justice, reparations, and guarantees of non-repetition. Thank you. Buenas tardes, señoras comisionadas, señores comisionados. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Sol Urcade. I'm from the team of Truth, Memory of Justice of the Center of Legal and Social Studies, CELS. I'm together with one of my colleagues from the litigation area. We would like to present the Argentine case. The responsibility or accountability of economic actors in Argentina was a part of the public agenda since the 80s, but as of 2010, it, it became more relevant. Between 2016 and 2019, we saw some drawbacks, especially with regard to some public policies and the judicial reactions or responses uh, in relation to corporate accountability. In recent years, we know that this process became more relevant, but there are no consolidated outcomes to say that this is being a matter that is being comprehensively addressed. In 1984, we have the National Commission on the Disappearance of Persons, the CONADEP, that mentioned that 11 companies were involved in human rights violations. However, at the time, those references did not lead to did not lead to investigations uh, to identify those responsibles within those companies. And in this new this new century, there was a significant contribution uh, in order to understand the accountability of companies in uh, crimes against humanity. 
the Secretary of Human Rights of Argentina. We have the program of truth and justice of the presidency, and we have also the involvement of organizations such as Flaxo and Cells. At least 25 companies participated in crimes against humanity. In 2015, the Congress of Argentina made a great achievement. It created a chamber or a division on memory, truth, and justice in order to strengthen democratic institutions, in order to identify um, corporate accountability during the last dictatorship. But so far, it's not operating. Regarding the search for justice, since 2013, judicial investigations into state terrorism uh, were initiated. And we see that there is a consolidation of the justice process. Within that context, the human rights movement in Argentina promoted new cases in order to guarantee or to identify corporate accountability. The mechanisms that are being used include legal proceedings as well as civil and administrative proceedings. When we talk about the use of the legal proceedings, we find that there are several issues that replicate throughout the legal proceeding. We identify huge delays during all the stages, especially during the evidence collection stage, we identify huge delays in order to move forward with the collection of evidence in order to continue with the assignment of responsibilities. We have the case of Mercedes Benz that was initiated in 2002. And in spite of all the requests that we have made before the Office of the Public Prosecutor, so, so that civil uh, authors are also uh, questioned, we have not achieved any results. We also identify that judicial operators request evidence standards that are higher than those applied in other areas, especially when it comes to um, military officers or security officers. We also identify delays in the trial stage, and we identify important issues to um, build the courts and there are only a few hearings, and therefore the proceedings take a lot of time. So far, only three cases have a ruling by a federal court. We have a case in Salta, we have the case Las Marias in Corrientes, and the case of Ford in the San Martin jurisdiction that was confirmed by the Cassation Court. Uh, in the appeals stage before the Cassation Court and the Supreme Court of Justice, uh, in those instances, we identify huge delays when it comes to the accountability of businessmen in human rights violations. Sometimes this is, is a huge concern because there are only a few rulings that are final. And when it comes to corporate accountability, we have a paradigmatic case. That is the case of the Noche de Apagón that involves um, officials and officers of the sugar company Ledesma. The justice took five years to um, resolve or to find a decision regarding a recourse regarding or related to one of the officers of the company, Antonio Lemos. And the president was, or came to a standstill. Six years later, the recourse was solved or resolved. And the case uh, ended up to a trial. But now the person says that has been accused is saying that uh, he is disabled and so he cannot be prosecuted. Also in the administrative uh, arena, we have some companies that are considered legal persons. And um, there was a good strategy that was used that was the connection of labor law with access to justice. We have, for example, the case of a lawsuit presented in 2008 by the daughter of Mr. Ingenieros. 
he requested compensation from the Chint because of the facts suffered by her father. Her father is disappeared and he disappeared at the factory of the Chint. The first instances, or the first instance court admitted the lawsuit of Enrique Ingenieros, but the Supreme Court dismissed that ruling and it said that the complaint for reparations uh, was prescribed and it should not be included in the administrative proceedings to guarantee reparations for the victims. Uh, now the case has been submitted before this honorable commission. Regarding the progress made regarding the justice process, we have identified some public policies implemented and those policies were promoted by the offices of the uh, Office of the Attorney General. In these cases, for example, in the case of the executive power and executive branch, what we're seeing is that these policies were promoted until 2015. And after that, those policies were dismantled by the government of Mauricio Macri. And as of 2020, some of these public policies were implemented again, but they are not consolidated. We will cover this later when we address the barriers related to this matter. Now I would like to give the floor to my colleague so that they can continue presenting. Thank you very much, Sol. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is Alejandro Jimenez. I'm representing the Center for Justice in Colombia. I want to present the case of Colombia. We have had a process of transitional justice for over 20 years, but despite that, the accountability of corporate actors in the internal regulation regulatory framework is still insufficient. Before 20, 2005, the responsibility to hold accountable those responsible in the conflicts was uh, was taken care by the uh, official ordinary justice. In 2005, we've had a framework, regulatory framework for um, military officials, the law of justice and peace. This was never designed for the accountability of economic actors. Different economic actors were identified and mentioned in this law for their role to foster paramilitary violence in the country. The cases were referred to the general attorney's office of the country. And despite that, we've managed to reconstruct partially the involvement of those actors in the conflict. The impunity was still the general uh, rule, but there were open cases. In 2011, through the restitution of lands, we've searched reparation for the victims of armed conflict. This should be uh, performed by the state, but the results were poor. And in the cases in which we've had private public partnerships, there were no uh, accountability and therefore no full reparation was achieved. The model of uh, retrievement of lands was not designed to, to unfortunately, the petitions were so much that the effective result was poor as well. So Colombia should uh, analyze its implementation. 2016, the national government and the FARC signed a peace agreement for transitional justice. And we have two important cases for the armed conflict com reparation, non-recurrence and uh, a final report, which is an opportunity to reconstruct, reconstruct 
truth and the involvement of economic actors. But there were obstacles due to the opposition of economic actors to, uh, pre to present themselves before the courts. We also created a mechanism to uh, account to create accountability. We have the ordinary justice and specific justice uh, courts in charge in charge of these uh, mechanisms. But participation is volunteer, so the duties fall on the general public prosecution's office. The participation in armed conflict is still a pending petition, pending situation to be addressed by the Colombian state. And it, there is no global and comprehensive mechanism. We have uh, complaints by victims and civil society organizations and research, but the advances are poor and impunity is still uh, prevailing. So it's, we've had some advances in other areas, but economic actors are not encouraged to participate. We still require state uh, representation, state involvement. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, commissioners and officials of the commission. My name is Gabriel Pereira. I'm a member of the Andes Human Rights Organization and also from a member from Advancing Human Rights Accountability Initiative. I will comment three obstacles that we find here in the region. First of all, we see there are um, legal obstacles, those related to legal activities. In the whole region, we see delays and slow advancing uh, measures because there is an impossibility of those who are uh, uh, accused to uh, appear before the court due to diseases or to their death, and also for the economic cost for the victims and families and people from the human rights organizations. Also, a second factor is that in this type of cases, we see criteria of uh, evident, evidence uh, assessment that are not uh, in line with the inter-American system. And third, we see that states fail to implement effective uh, regulatory frameworks to uh, hold accountable those uh, people who are involved in these types of issues and conflicts, and they fail to uh, comply with the obligation to make an effort to comply the objectives of the inter-American system. We also see some obstacles in the cases of civil labor or other types of uh, litigations for reparations because we see that it's possible that these actions are used uh, here in, in the region and they face different obstacles. We have not used these types of actions in the region so far, but we've had some uh, different uh, opportunities. We see a risk uh, such as the one in the Supreme Court in Argentina. We see limit limitations. And these types of actions are seen as uh, moments in which uh, equal parts uh, resolve their conflicts, but also we see extrajudicial uh, agreements that are frequently used in different cases are being taken, uh, are being carried out outside of the ordinary uh, system. They are uh, confidential, uh, companies are not held accountable. For instance, the case of Volkswagen is interesting because they uh, separate themselves from the crimes against humanity they committed. Besides these types of agreements, we had uh, agreements outside of the effective monitoring system of state uh, agencies, which should preserve a balance between the parties. Apparently, in reparations, justice and truth depends on uh, different agents and not on human rights. Uh, organizations. Also, the civil 
method is uh, dangerous because since there are no international standards on this matter, some victims can access some reparations and not other reparations. And finally, other problems we observe is that these types of actions can fail in the face of statutes of limitations of civil actions in Argentina. We can also discuss this later. We've seen a case that we mentioned before, and we need clear standards as how we have to legislate on reparations outside of the uh, criminal courts. We also see that state's response is in the hands of uh, institutions and not on the hands of public policies. This means that in cases in which we see state's response, we see uh, volunteers, we see willingness, but that we not, do not see the action of the state. In the cases in which we observe these types of policies, we see a concerning characterization of uh, fragmentation and um, changing nature of, uh, of the cases. In Argentina, for instance, we implemented until 2005 different policies from different bodies, from the executive branch and from different independent organizations. But those agencies were able to develop public policies with uh, a coordination between and among institutions. However, unfortunately, the power of these policies has been uh, undermined recently. So as we mentioned before, it's concerning that we don't have specific recommendations within the design of the truth commissions. And finally, we want to uh, mention the facto uh, obstacles. We see that there are uh, actors who have the possibility to veto, who can, who can obstruct these processes of truth and justice because they have strategies, mechanisms, uh, a whole wide range of impunity mechanisms to obstruct those processes. So these strategies are widespread, for instance, uh, the passing of time, which we've mentioned before, or the benefit that these economic groups receive, because those who committed crimes against humanity are part of the social, cultural, and economic elites in our countries. In cases of, uh, for instance, in Argentina, 20 judges do not intervene in a case because they are clearly related to the uh, defendants. So all these strategies delay the results of the case. Other strategies we see is the revolving doors, which uh, also adds to the strategy of uh, social uh, with uh, officials, for instance, in the Supreme Court of Justice in Argentina, we see a judge who was really uh, closely related to the corporate environment. And we see public campaigns to remove leg legitimacy from activists and human rights organizations. We've seen this in Colombia and in Argentina. The great economic actors have the resources to implement uh, campaigns to delegitimize those who are involved. And unfortunately, the veto uh, uh, actors resort to threats. Uh, recently, we've seen the case in, uh, in Argentina. We've reached the point of uh, extreme violence, for instance, in the case of Berta Cáceres. We see that the lack of standards, clear inter-American standards in the matter of human rights to limit the actors who have the possibility to veto leads us to impunity. We need these standards to balance the power and impunity that we see for those actors in our region. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commissioner Antonia. We would like to request five extra minutes to uh, provide our recommendation, recommendations. Thank you very much. My, my name is Leonor Arteaga. We represent the Foundation for Due uh, Process, DPLF. On the basis of what we 
presented here in this hearing, we want to request from this commission first that they prepare a th thematic report to consolidate the standards in terms of economic responsibility in processes of uh, truth and justice for serious human rights violations so that we have um, the participation of the state. This report should include the most common corporate behaviors and the human rights violations related to that, uh, state repression, dictatorship, etc., to identify strategies for accountability in the region. We also propose that in that report, we develop a special focus on the disproportionate impact of corporations on women and children to then develop programs for reparation with a gender gender based uh, point of view secondly we request the inter-american commission that in their different mechanisms they recommend the states that first in transitional justice, justice mechanisms who are designed to provide justice and reparations, that they include the uh, clarification of the facts and the responsibility of the actors, including economic and corporate actors. This implies that institutional designs should be oriented to investigate these responsibilities, the accountability of those economic actors and that institutions in charge should have the necessary tools to respond to the necessities deriving of these types of special investigations. This should also include the creation of a political and social environment to effectively implement these mechanisms, including support of the investigations to reconstruct the facts and the development of public policies to address the role of those economic actors during the conflict or repression uh, moments. Besides, the states who have gone through these stages should promote measures to reconstruct the social fabric um, and these measures should also involve the economic sectors and their representatives however the participation in these actions is independent from the accountability that derives from the participation of those individuals companies or trade unions in violence that is Social responsibility frameworks are not an alternative to face the legal state and individual obligations not to respond to the needs of justice by the victims. We also believe that it's key that the Commission reviews the action plans, the national action plans, which were created from the uh, guideline principles who have turned 10 years recently and in this revision of the of the plans we could uh, demand the states to guarantee due diligence in terms of uh, justice and non-repetition mechanisms also it's very important that the state at the moment of uh, holding accountable uh, corporations that they include this consideration, consider, considering uh, legal persons, because it's very important that the states promote a wide vision, a wide range of labor and civil actions in the context of transitional justice to protect the rights of the victims on their next of kin to this effective remedies. Also, these types of cases should include collective reparations, and it's important to focus as well on the complexity of how companies organize themselves, because it's very important that in the accountability they include cooperation mechanisms between institutions that that 
companies can uh, effectively uh, be held accountable in all the different ways in which they are organized. Thank you very much. And we also, sorry, I wanted to add that we uh, delivered a report today in which we uh, go delve deeper into the details of this uh, hearing. Thank you very much, Leonor. You'll have more time later to provide more details on whatever matter you want. Now I will give the floor to my colleagues. I have some comments, but first of all, I will give the floor to my colleagues. I don't know if first Vice President, Vice President Julissa Madilla wants to take the floor. Yes, thank you very much, Madam President. Good afternoon to all. It's a pleasure to meet you uh, for the first time, some of you, and some of you for uh, after a long time since we've last seen each other. I wanted to start by thanking you for this space. It's really important in line to consolidate the standards that combine the fight against impunity and inter-American state standards in terms of transitional justice. In that sense, since you've explained uh, judicial uh, cases, I wanted to have some clarification on this. In terms of reparation, have you had information on reparations and guarantees of non-recurrence besides concrete actions? We know how long it can take uh, for a trial or a legal process. So in transitional justice, have you had any experiences in terms of uh, guidelines for non-recurrence guarantees? I think this is something that we can build as regards these cases. And also in terms of reparations, especially for the Colombian case. The system establishes different projects for reparations that were to be built or developed. And those who were in line with the system, they could develop different projects. And in fact, there are small projects undergoing. So I wanted to know if there have been any support from any companies in this uh, context and if there had been any um, opposition between the companies who had been part of this uh, human rights violations and if they were involved or incorporated into these systems afterwards. In that sense, I remember from my time in Colombia that there were some initiatives. I don't, I don't want to uh, mis be mistaken, but there was uh, some supermarkets, I think that they were incorporating people that were affected. So I wanted to know if this kind of initiatives were still uh, in force or ongoing. And of course, on the one hand, this is, you've spoken about impunity and for, from the people who were part of human rights violations. But I wanted to get some clarification of um, the participation of corporations in reparations and non-recurrence guarantees. So in this comprehensive view, I thought it was important to see if you had this type of information. And in that, in that line, what Leonora Arteaga was mentioning as regards women and children, I wanted to have a um, wider view for LGBTIQ uh, communities. I wanted to know if, as regards transitional justice, especially for Colombia, we've had, we had a specific report as regards the situation of LGBTI people and what they were going through uh, during those times. So if I wanted to know if there were some uh, participation or omission from companies or corporations regarding this, if there was some gender-based uh, perspective uh, on, on this topic. That would be all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Commissioner Mantilla. I don't know if Commissioner Esmeralda would like to make any questions. I thought you were going to get the floor first to Commissioner Joel. I would like first to greet all of you. Um, indeed, this is hearing is a great opportunity to listen to you, to be able to make this specific analysis of what 
um, improving our thematic report could mean, could imply. I know that we have the special rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. And in that thematic report, what we had was a great opportunity to make this a state responsibility if making sure that businesses are committed to the compliance and observance of human rights in their actions. And the Inter-American system is not here uh, or the argument of saying that the Inter-American system is not here to judge uh, legal persons. Um, makes us think that in fact, businesses are actors in their countries and therefore they are accountable in the construction of democracy. So in the request, we uh, are told to think about how we can consolidate these standards in a comprehensive way by including truth, memory, justice in relation to the actions of this economic actors or businesses that have been involved in human rights violations. So my question and my observation has to do with that, how we can improve the thematic report that we have regarding businesses and human rights. So as to consolidate inter-American standards uh, to have a specialized thematic report. I would like to know what you think about it. And the other aspect that I would like to mention that caught my eye, I would like to know that uh, in the evaluation that you're making regarding the work of truth commissions, sometimes the competence uh, they have is limited. And I know Commissioner Mantilla uh, participated in one of these truth commissions in Colombia, and she has a lot of clarity about the impact of these commissions and their role. And you were telling us that sometimes they have limitations and restrictions, especially with regard to the compliance of those recommendations and action established by these commissions, uh, especially in your work in the search of truth, memory, and justice, including everything that has to do with impunity, etc. cetera. So uh, that's what I wanted to know. What's your evaluation about all this? I would like to thank you for this opportunity because you provided us with a broad perspective of what, uh, why it is necessary to focus so that a very important actor in our societies participates and gets involved. Those are the economic actors in businesses. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you, Commissioner Esmeralda. Commissioner Joel, you have the floor. Thank you, Madam President. I'd like to be very brief. Commissioner Asemen and Commissioner, Commissioner Mantisha made very important comments in this regard. And I'm sure the special rapporteur and you will have additional elements. So I just want to thank the organizations that are here to bring to the table such a relevant issue that, is, that has so many unique aspects. I, in my experience, I never thought before about the responsibility as the accountability of economic actors in memory, truth, and justice. 
and your presentation has helped me to understand that accountability and that responsibility. And taking into consideration a broader perspectives, especially the situation of businesses and human rights, as Commissioner Arasemena was saying, and the special rapporteur will mention this for sure, um, the commission in its um, report on businesses and human rights identify the obligations of the states with regard to businesses so that the role of businesses is compatible with the human rights standards. I would like to highlight one of the elements that I think that you should address in your next intervention. And that element has to do with social responsibility of economic actors, especially regarding their role in reparation processes and non-repetition processes. Um, we are not talking about criminally accountable actors because of crimes committed against persons, but I'd like to know about the role of these actors in uh, the processes of memory, truth, and justice and their collaboration to those processes. Commissioner Manticha was mentioning an example from Colombia, and I think it would be attractive to see what you have found, because I think that uh, that's, that's an aspect uh, and businesses that should be uh, explored. Thank you, Commissioner Hernandez. Before giving the floor to the Special Rapporteur for Economic, Social, Culture, and Environmental Rights, uh, who led this report that I was mentioned, I would like to speak first. As Rapporteur for Memory, Truth, and Justice, I would like to thank all of you for all the information that you have provided us with. I think that the systematic violations that we have seen across the continent were not possible because of the state agents, but also because of these private actors, and you account for that. And this goes beyond what was said. They were the passive um, uh, accomplices. They were also active participants because they reported their workers, their employees, they financed clandestine centers, they finance human rights violations. They finance the supply of armament. And we have also the active involvement of companies in material violations or violations related to material aspects. And as you were saying, as a non-repetition guarantee, it's important to face this issue directly across the continent. And this, is something that we owe. And this is not only a role that should be played by the judiciary. We need the inter-American system to address this as well. The report on businesses and human rights prepared by the commission together with the Redesca uh, has been fundamental. But I think that we are still owing some things. We need to present recommendations regarding the creation of public policies by states, especially with regard to truth, memory, and justice. And I think that something that we should discuss has to do with the criminal responsibility of companies in the interior of the countries, but also within the inter-American system. And there's an issue that you have not mentioned, uh, and the commission has been working on that, is the issue of corruption. We have a report on corruption and human rights that is closely related to this issue and the role of companies and businesses and how companies have captured the state, the important role of businesses that uh, capture the state. And the commission has standards to fight corruption. And this is very important because it has to do with businesses capturing states and the lack of accountability. And I think that the commission and you can work together in human rights and corruption and the involvement of businesses in all that. I think that as, as thematic rapporteur, um, you were mentioning the need for a thematic report regarding corporate accountability in memory, truth and justice. Uh, processes. I think that the commission could start working on the basis of the previous reports, but I think that 
Uh, I will no longer be a member of the commission next year, but I think that the rapporteurship of memory, truth and justice should include this issue next year. It's something that we need to explore. It's not something that we need to dig into. You were also mentioning action plans in businesses and human rights. And I would like to say that the commission, I will be honest here, we have had several discussions with web in web through webinars with the Office of the High Commissioner on Human Rights. Maybe we should have a coordinated work with the United Nations in this matter to get the Commission and the UN system and the organizations that address this issue should work together so that in the businesses and human rights national plans, everything that has to do with due diligence and extractive in industries and climate change is included. And we need to include uh, companies and businesses in that discussion. They are not only uh, the ones who commit human rights violations, they can collaborate. And without their participation, we cannot move forward in all these areas. And that should be a non-repetition guarantee. So the challenge is how the Inter-American system could include in that discussion uh, or could include companies in that discussion because businesses are key actors in this matter. And I think that uh, Commissioner Esmeralda was asking about the truth commissions in the region. Some of those commissions have dealt with this in the past. And I think that one of the challenges is how we can use our internal mechanisms, those mechanisms that we have created in recent years, how we can use the GAs to take into consideration the corp corporate accountability. I'm honest and I'm free to say this because I will no longer be a member of the commission, but that's something that we need to discuss. And this is something that I said uh, since I started my mandate, my term. Uh, I think that we should have worked more than this. It has to do with the role of multilateral bodies in this matter and the responsibility of multilateral bodies not only for the guidelines that they have in terms of human rights, businesses, and prior and free consultation. Because uh, we have companies and businesses that were compromised because of this. And it's important that we have clarity about this in order to have non-repetition guarantees. I would like to mention these ideas because of the issues you brought to the table. And I would like to mention this for my colleagues because we have a huge work to do here in this regard. I would like to give the floor to Soledad Garcia Munoz. I cannot see her on the screen, but I would like to give her the floor. She's a special rapporteur for economic, social, cultural, and environmental rights. Thank you, Madam President. I would like to thank this opportunity uh, participating in this hearing together with the commissioners. I would like to greet the commissioners, the assistant executive secretary, and I would like to thank the members of civil society because they are bringing to the table this important issue and with a lot of clarity. And as you, the president of the commission was saying, and I fully agree with her, with her criteria, I think that this is a very relevant matter for all economic actors, not only for businesses, but also other economic actors, such as international uh, bodies. For example, the recommendations of the reports on businesses and human rights also cover these actors. So I think that your comment is very timely, and this hearing is also very timely. As Commissioner Rosemena was saying, and as Commissioner Hernandez was saying as well, this matter was presented in general terms in the matter report on businesses and human rights that includes uh, as context of a special concern, the transitional justice and corporate accountability. And also we have the fiscal policy fiscal practices and their impact on public decision-making. In that regard, I'd like to say that the report makes reference, especially to the fact that in these processes, material impacts and economic interests should be considered, but together with economic, social, cultural, environmental rights. Um, 
This is included in paragraph 218 of the report that includes a specific recommendation that I think should be the foundation uh, to work in this uh, project together with the rapporteurship of memory, truth, and justice. I think that this is a paradigmatic issue for the region. And in that regard, I would like to ask you if you have any information about uh, practices that could be replicated. I don't like the word best practices. I'm talking between inverted commas. I was thinking about the case of Brazil. I think that you mentioned something in that regard, but I would like to know what you think about that agreement that was signed between the company in Brazil and the Office of the Public Prosecutor uh, in Brazil and 36,000 reais uh, were um, handed over to each of the employees who suffered human rights violations during the dictatorship. I don't know if you have information about that initiative and what do you think about it? And I would like to mention recommendation number two of our report. In that recommendation, we call open states if they want to have national reparation plans, they should not ignore their um, legal frameworks. The report establishes the obligations, but we also identify recommendations and those that are pending uh, resolution. And I think that we need to see how we can implement those recommendations that have been issued by the commission that are very clear. And in terms of national plans, I would like to say that the Redesca has a very fruitful agenda together with the United Nations and with some states of the region. For example, we are working with Ecuador and Peru. We have provided technical assistance to them. And I think that's a good line of work that we should improve because there are a lot of opportunities over there. Thank you. And we are at your disposal to continue articulating our efforts. Thank you, Soledad. I would like to give the floor back to the organizations of civil society so that they can comment and provide additional information and to answer some of the questions that we asked. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Um, Good afternoon, commissioners, executive, assistant executive secretary, rapporteur, and all those uh, participants of this meeting. My name is Camilo Sanchez. I'm from the Human Rights Clinic of the University of Virginia. I thank you for your questions and comments. I think they are related to some of the issues that we wanted to present in this hearing. I would like to talk about reparations uh, and the question asked by Commissioner Mantilla and Commissioner Hernandez, and I would like to relate this to what Commissioner Antonia Urrejola was saying and some of the comments made by the special rapporteurs towards the end of this presentation. Reparations. Probably this is the area in which less progress has been made in the region and around the world. Uh, Soledad, one of the most important issues is to move forward with reparations. With Miguel Barbosa, we research the national plans around the world, and we found that no plan addresses reparations. I think that we have a huge possibility there, and the commission could be a uh, um, very important actor. It could promote a global initiative in terms of reparations and non-repetition guarantees, and it could collect the specific experiences throughout the region and could be included. And also, in the current draft of transitional justice, memory, truth, and justice, in the draft treat that has been discussed, there is no information there about reparations. I think that the commission has a lot to contribute there. And in terms of reparations, what we have right now is the following. The region has promoted uh, reparation through two mechanisms, extrajudicial mechanisms through administrative processes and the judicial uh, way. In terms of the judicial way, there have been no reparations because sometimes our reparations uh, 
there are only few reparations deriving for, from the criminal proceedings and it's difficult to identify the legal accountability or responsibility of some individuals. And therefore it's impossible to connect economic reparations to uh, the proceedings. And also there are several legal barriers to claim uh, legal reparations for uh, civil damages, especially because of the expiration of the statute of limitations. Also, it's difficult to prove directly the relationship uh, between the action and the damage. That's something that is very difficult to deal with at a legal uh, stage. So many of the organizations use civil lawsuits in other states, for example, in the United States, in the UK and in Canada. But we have uh, only some material progress made. We have the case of Guatemala, and in spite of the fact that several cases had positive rulings by American courts, the rulings were just uh, important, but they do not have any economic reparation or compensation. So we have a pending issue. We need to see how we can integrate those reparation measures. I think that they are based on the fact that the state cannot undermine its responsibility. It cannot ignore its responsibility. So reparation mechanisms in the administrative arena are based on the state responsibility. That's a good measure. But we need to identify the responsibility of those individuals who committed these violations. What has happened recently in uh, post-conflict processes, uh, states have to deal with many things at the same time. They have to stop violence, they have to rebuild the state, they have to promote economic development, and they have to establish justice mechanisms. The measures include initiatives and companies, for example, those that arise from corporate social responsibility. Those are based on reconstructing or rebuilding the state or stopping the violence. Uh, what Commissioner Mantisha was saying regarding those businesses in Colombia who work with demobilized people. And then we have initiatives to promote economic development. And that was because of an initiative the state. The states have decided to reduce tax so that companies invest in those areas that were most affected. But uh, what does this cost? In spite, of, uh, in spite of the fact that those measures could be fundamental, they are not reparations in themselves. And that's a huge challenge ahead, how we can promote these measures, but in a way that this is not presented as the compliance of legal observations in the area of reparations. So we have the responsibility of the states, they sometimes are tempted to invite uh, private investment uh, because sometimes um, they understand that this is a way of reparating, but they should do this apart from this economic reparation. In Colombia, there are several collective reparation programs that are being promoted by the state as financed by companies when you study the social public and private investment in collective reparations you realize that the investment of the state uh, through public sources is huge uh, the state invested in institutions and so on and there are some private actors some businesses and uh, that uh, are more visible. And many of these uh, collective reparations have been sold as uh, led by these private companies, but it's not like that. We need to end with the idea of reparations being paid by those who are responsible. Uh, that should be that is important, but we have an issue that is that 
there is no immediacy between uh, the violation that is identified and the reparation that should be provided. And for example, we have foundations that are including this corporate social responsibility of some businesses or business groups. Sometimes those foundations participate in the reparation processes and and they try to divide that from the company. So it's foundation X or Y and not the company that is providing reparation. Who were the actual uh, uh, actors accountable? So I think that's a huge challenge we have ahead as civil society and uh, in the commission. We need to have clear standards because sometimes there is reparation when there is no reparation at all. So. With regard to some of the questions made by the commissioners, I think that we have a good opportunity uh, to join efforts together with the United Nations. We have the working group of the United Nations on businesses and human rights. They are preparing a guide, a guide on reparations and transitional justice that would allow states and companies to understand those standards that should be included in their policies. And again, I think that the uh, ability of the commission to use the region so that the region is a pioneer in the efforts of the United Nations, I think that the role of the commission could be fundamental. I think that the commission could help a lot in that discussion. In order not to take up more time I think that we have some individual cases in Colombia that are very important. And I think that my co one of my colleagues, could talk, Tatiana, could talk about the um, legal and peace jurisdiction. Sometimes we have a lack of relationship between the legal person and the individuals that made up, make up that legal person. Sometimes when um, you have the jurisdiction for peace and justice, uh, sometimes people appear as individuals and not as a corporate. And therefore the ability to reparate is less. They go to justice and they say, I can tell the truth, but I cannot provide reparations because I don't have many economic resources. So in that process, we lose the ability to reparate the victims. Good afternoon, Gabriel Pereira again. I will be very brief to uh, go back to some, to some of the topic. You, you've mentioned. So thank you very much to the special rapporteur and uh, the commissioners and the special rapporteur's report has been key. So thank you very much for drafting it. So I completely agree with Camilo. In terms of reparations, uh, we had a pending agenda and it's quite uh, uh, divided. We've seen many initiatives in many parts of the countries, and we actually need to have a, a more focused uh, perspective to see what is actually being done. There are things we should see through a different lens. For instance, we have opportunities for uh, reparations uh, even in criminal cases. In Argentina, we've had experience in this matter. My colleagues from the cells could uh, go deeper into that. For instance, the Ford case in which we had uh, reparations as regards the participation or the responsibility to uh, the violations against different collectives, for instance, leaders of trade unions. It's very important to see how there is a criminal case against officials, public officials has a more collective reparation as a result, which has happened in different uh, criminal cases and it could be uh, good to explore further. We mentioned the fourth case, which has been widely uh, debated. There's uh, some pros, some cons, and then we uh, implemented some non, 
reparation, non-recurrence uh, guarantees and how the funds had been implemented to hold accountable the economic actors in, in the country. So in terms of reparations, we have uh, a lot of work to do and we should see how we can foster, how we can promote what we've been doing we can draft reports there are lots of information could be systematized to start to explore this ways forward especially because in many of the countries in region we know that legal uh, ways or criminal ways is being exhausted because of all of what we discussed before so it's very important to see the issues of reparations and access to justice especially and I wanted to mention as well uh, what we mentioned of economic actors and their perspective. So instead of only looking to a company, we should look at economic actors as a whole. And I wanted to comment on this because it's hard to find those good practices or best practices, especially in countries in the southern cone. But when you have a wider lens, you can see, for instance, in Argentina, that there are uh, economic actors, not, not companies, economic actors. For instance, the central bank itself incorporated measures to collect information which provided data to reconstruct, to, to find truth. Many of them were essential to investigate uh, judicially. So we should work with the state in the case with uh, independent organizations, but many times we should be careful and have this wide vision, as you mentioned, because the stakeholders are complex and there are there's a wide maneuvering space to see alternatives so that would be my comment thank you well very briefly i'm sol Urcada again um i wanted to comment on what ada semena uh, mentioned which has to do with the commissions of truth we face many commissions uh, committees of truth which have not investigated the responsibility of corporate or economic actors. In one of the investigations we've carried out, we found that where we see the most progress after the, in a long term, is where the truth commissions recommend the creation of institutions that stand over time to uh, address human rights violations. Once these institutions are in place, we can develop public policies to precisely feed, foster the advancement of progress in terms of uh, memory, truth, and justice. For instance, in Argentina, after the uh, final work of CONADEP, we've created the Subsecretariat for Human Rights, which created a whole structure that is still in force to, to date. That secretariat intervened in this report on corporate uh, responsibility in human rights violations. We also investigated in crimes with economic motivation. So we think it's key that truth commissions create recommendations to create institutions that focus on research and fostering of human rights so that we can delve deeper in these issues, even though if originally it was not uh, up to them to address these issues. Thank you very much. Maybe uh, here, uh, I'm Dion Morales from the cells as well. Good afternoon. It's a pleasure to see some of you again and to get to know some of you. So basically what I wanted to comment on, what I wanted to add to what uh, Sol Urcade mentioned, and it has to do with the law in Argentina that created a bicameral committee in terms of what uh, Julissa Mantisha was mentioning. The commission has the objective to create a report with detailed information and the consequences of the intervention of corporations in serious crimes against humanities. But there's also a subsection in this same law that 
reads that the commission should formulate concrete proposal to uh, create memory and to point to the accomplices and strengthen democratic institutions and to discourage the conducts that are being under investigation. This was approved in 2015 and it's still not in force. This could be uh, part of the message for, um, from the Inter-American Commission so that they include the situation of Argentina. We have a body that could provide answers in this matter, but the state of Argentina is not implementing it for different reasons. This could be an important point. The second point, is that part of what we are presenting here at the hearing is part of the work from the victims themselves and the same and the workers and trade union organizations themselves as Gabriel Pereira mentioned just now trade unions organizations workers themselves are fostering this process of truth memory and justice and human rights organizations are accompanying that work so i think that is very important a relevant information we should incorporate trade union organizations in this possible uh, progression from the inter-american commission in this matter and we're not pointing out anything that is new to us the inter-american commission in from 20, 2020 to 2010 has developed in some way a concrete proposals that then the Inter-American Court uh, resorted to in their rulings to establish reparations when violations are carried out by corporate uh, organizations or actors. So I think that is something from the experience of the Inter-American Commission itself that could be resorted to to link workers with this types of, of petitions. I wanted to uh, add on something that Camilo mentioned before and has to do with reparation in the jurisdiction for peace in Colombia is related to what Diego just mentioned as regards the importance that we need to give to trade union organizations and workers. In the Colombian case, it's fortunate that we are seeing uh, right now that there's a confusion with the system. In cases in which we are carrying out processes with economic uh, actors, corporations are not mentioned and not all stakeholders qualify as victims. Some of the trade unions we've been working for a year cannot, could not participate fully in the transitional process. And this is innovative and this uh, gave way to reparation. So we see there's a lack of participation and the system is really confusing and reparation is being done on the outside of this system. I wanted to comment this very briefly because it's important as regards the recommendation we made on the importance of uh, providing support from the states to transitional justice uh, mechanisms. We've seen campaigns to undermine uh, this process is in Colombia and the state, the government, does not support it this transitional justice mechanism. So there is certain uh, lack of confidence. And unfortunately, we've seen that this has had a consequence, negative consequence in praxis to uh, develop reparation and the participation of victims in this types of systems. Catherine, I think she wanted to have the floor. Yes, if I may, I will speak in English. Thank you very much, all the commissioners, to Radesca and to the representatives of the executive secretariat. Commissioner Orihola for mentioning uh, the issue of corruption. That's a very vital issue. And when we're talking about the, the subject of today with the private sector actors and truth, memory, and justice, um, this is such a complex issue, as everyone has heard from the testimony today, that it's absolutely true that we need to take a, a transversal and intersectional, intersectional perspective. 
Um, and we certainly appreciate the, the reference to the corruption report that the commission issued in uh, 2019, which has been very impactful and, um, and a true step forward to be able to approach the issue of corruption from a human rights perspective. Uh, that report, as you all are aware, uh, mentions and discusses the right to truth and how it's intimately tied to guarantees of non-repetition, as well as to the social harm caused by corruption. So there is a lot, absolutely, that the Commission could build upon um, in, a, in a subsequent report that's particularly focused on um, truth, memory, and justice with respect to private sector actors uh, looking at what has already been done uh, by the Commission in the corruption report. Um, in the report that we submitted for this hearing to, uh, to the Commission, we discussed briefly um, how the issue of corruption and how there has been a pattern in the region of exchange of benefits and support between repressive governments and businesses that benefit from that state repression. Um, and there are uh, some examples, Most, I would say one of the most notable ones, of course, is that of the Berta Caceres case in Honduras, where there was uh, you know, corruption at the highest level that uh, facilitated and was complicit in her assassination, and then later in uh, both before and after in repression and um, legal uh, legal maneuvering to avoid accountability and to further the impunity gap. I would also just want to mention that this this debate that we're having here today is useful not only for the countries that have have been discussed, but also for others. Um, most I would say particularly Venezuela and Nicaragua, where we see ongoing grave human rights violations that are intimately tied to grand corruption. Um, and so in conclusion, I just wanted to particularly thank Antonia for her work uh, as um, on the commission in the past four years and as Rapporteur for Memory, Truth and Justice. We truly appreciate your, your dedication to these issues and to the rights of victims. So thank you very much uh, to everyone for listening to us today and we look forward to further discussion. Bien, eh, no sé si alguien más... Very well, I don't know if anyone else can wants to uh, make a comment. Thank you very much, Catherine, for your words. Does anyone else wants to want to add something before we end this hearing? Well, if not, just once again, thank you very much to all the organizations who are here today with us. I think it's been a very important and interesting hearing. We've had a lot of information and I hope that on the basis of this hearing, we can have a roadmap so that we can go further into this issue with all the complexities you've mentioned yourselves. And the commissioners, we are aware of this, but sincerely, I do hope that we can use this hearing to start building a roadmap and an action plan for the following year. I'm sure that the commissioners here today and the executive secretary uh, together with the special rapporteur will uh, take this job and those who will uh, uh, be part of the uh, of my uh, special rapporteurship will also take charge of this i don't know if maria claudia wanted to say something yes we've taken down notes of all the uh, requests you've mentioned in this uh, hearing on all the interesting topics you've mentioned in terms of an annual uh, report, annual plan 2022, uh, so that we can have a roadmap, as the Madam President said, for those who uh, will be in charge of the special rapporteurship on truth, memory, and justice. And we've had Shana Santos here the whole time, who is a specialist from the rapporteurship and who will be continuing to work with this issue. So we take this challenge and of course, we will have the commission uh, available for the work on this topic on next year. Thank you very much and a hug to all of you. Thank you very much, Maria Claudia. Uh, Shana Santos has her camera off, but I want to say that she is the uh, driver of this uh, special repetition and she will be, she will continue to do so. so be rest assured she will continue working on this so thank you very much for all the information you conveyed it's been really interesting and to me as a special rapporteur for truth memory and justice it's an honor to finish my term with a topic i'm very interested in so personally i really thank you for allowing me to be present at this uh hearing thank you very much